So welcome everybody at my presentation about metaprogramming in Scala. Look at this wizard cup. It's here for a reason. Today we'll be playing with very powerful API. We'll be tokenizing code, parsing code, and even modifying code written by developer. So in one word, it will be a lot of magic. But as you will see in examples, it won't be a black magic. We'll be able to create a lot of goodness. We'll be able to create tools which help us, which will help us write better programs, better software. Or better than this. Okay, so without further introduction, let's start. And a slide about me. Uh, so my name is Bartosz Bombol. Uh, I have an updated photo of me. Yeah, so this is what happens to you when you start to write meta program. And let's spend 20 minutes talking about me right now. So uh, you can find me on Twitter and blog. If you want to contact me, you will find uh, contact to me there. And on my blog, you will find also a couple of blog posts about metaprogramming in Scala. Today's, today, we've got only 45 minutes to, to introduce some topic, to sell you some idea, but it's not enough to cover every detail of each example. So I encourage you to preview it if you will find this topic interesting. And moreover, currently, I work and live in Thailand, where I work for a company called Agoda. You probably heard about us. Maybe you have even booked hotel using our application. And we are recruiting right now. So if you want to... Mm, use newest software and work with, with outstanding people, uh, tackle not trivial problems, I encourage you to talk to me. I will give you more information than HR because HR doesn't code, obviously, right? So uh, if you don't want to talk to me, which is absolutely reasonable, you can send mail to this jobs, agoda.com, where just write that you are from functional conf. It will be easier to recognize you. Okay, so, ah, traditional survey. Who have heard about Scala Macros or Scala Meta? Two people, three, four. Okay, and who have used Scala Macros or Scala Meta or read, write something? Okay, minority. That's good, that's good. So before we start, uh, we will need to draw some timeline because um, metaprogramming meta ecosystem in Scala evolves in, chain, evolves in speed of light. So we'll need to you know, establish some uh, timeline before we start, so kind of history. A, a lot of things changes in re recent months. So let's start with a past. And in Scala 2.10, we had experimental feature called macro. And they were experimental for four or five years. And besides some usage by library creators, you will still hear, some, still hear something like, don't use macros, don't use macros. It's some kind of a magic, which is true still. But uh, that there was experimental feature. It wasn't stable par part of the language. So in June this year, creator of the macros, Eugene Burmako, introduced a library called Scala Meta. And it was clean, new implementation of meta programming toolkit, as the definition of this library says. So now some horror music should play, because like in a good Hitchcock movie, we'll start with an earthquake. And macros are dead. And that was conclusion from Martin Odersky keynote at Scala Days this year. And so creator of the language in one of the biggest conference uh, in Scala community excluded macros as the uh, future feature of the language, right? So uh, you might say something like, okay, cool. So this is why I paid for functional conf ticket, right? <laughs> Just to hear that biggest part of metaprogramming language will be excluded from the language, right? But keep calm. That was Friday at Scala days, right? So I said that Metaprogramming in Scala evolves in speed of light. So update, let's update our timeline. We've got uh, experimental feature called macros, which in future versions will be deprecated, right? right? So that was Friday. And on Saturday, creator of macros, Eugene Burmako, the same guy who has released the Scala Meta thing, come on the stage and presented new approach mentioned by Martin Odersky. So presented new macros, which will be in the future versions of Scala. So purpose of those slides are just to say you macros are not dead. They are going to be refactored. The API will be changed sometimes drastically, as Eugene said. But it's still going to be a feature of the language. So let's summarize those slides. And this is our final, final timeline. We've got deprecated feature macros. We've got Scala Meta. And on top of Scala Meta, we've got new macros with the new API. And today, we'll be focusing on those two parts of the language, right? 
And we will start with macros. We'll start with macros, then we'll go to Scala Meta. So you might say, st still say something like, okay, cool, so creator of the macros said that they are not gonna be remote, but nothing is for sure. It's still experimental feature of the language. Why should you care? So let's stay with Scala days and uh, let's look at the presentation of Matei Zaharia, the, the one of the creators of Apache Spark framework. We'll not be talking about Apache Spark right now. Uh, I'm just showing you to, to, to give you some bigger perspective. So <clears throat> creator of the Spark, uh, he was presenting roadmap for future versions of Apache Spark, like big data framework. And he, uh, on one of the slides, he uh, pointed macros as a way to improve future API, to optimize it more and understand better code written by developer. And why I show this slide? I just want to give you some kind of a notion of macros that you will encounter macros in more and more presentations, that it's not a niche part of the language. It will be, I think, more and more popular recently. So who else uses macros? So I have outlined here some Scala superstars, which somewhere under the hood uses macros. And today we'll focus a bit more on play framework. And, uh, but if somebody is from Scala ecosystem, they should recognize all those libraries, right? Then you will be able to I should, I should update okay. this talk after talking with you. So if you wanna hear something about Scala, this is the right person to talk and how they are gonna use macros. So before we'll start with describing those um, this example, let's establish some common domain. So what is metaprogramming? And meta is a prefix which comes from Greek language and it means it's a bound own category. And what does it mean? So for example, if you are saying a joke between talks, today talks, during the break, and you are saying joke about some other joke, it's not a normal joke, it's a meta joke, right? If you've got data which describes other data in your database or in your file or in your JSON, it's a metadata. And if you've got program, which programs other program, it's a meta program, right? So we will be writing programs which will be modifying other programs. And why you want a program which modify other program, right? You've got a program which operates on databases, right? right? You've got programs which program some servers. Why you wanna write a program uh, to, which modifies other program? You want to do this because you are lazy. And you are lazy too. And we are all lazy in this room. And, but we are lazy in a good way. We are lazy, we don't want to do some redundant work. We don't want to write boilerplate code, right? So, let's look at this analogy. You want to drive this nice car. It's red, it's sporty, it's easy to drive. But in your everyday work, you need this huge machine. It's super hard to drive. It's even easy, it's even hard to start, right? If something goes wrong, it's hard to repair. But you need it. But your dream is to drive this, this nice red piece of syntax. And this is the main idea for macros. Uh, okay, so let's move to some uh, real world example, right? So you've got parsing case class to a JSON. If you are not from Scala uh, community, case class, whatever, object to some JSON, very common situation, right? How to do this in play framework? In play framework, you've got method write. And this method, you have to specify, you invoke this method for each field for your JSON, right? Nothing wrong with this code. You just have to, for each mm, field, you have to spe specify this type, invoke method. Don't focus on the code, it's not important. What is important in this code, let's think about code on the left, like about a words, a bag of words, a set of some tokens. And let's think about this. If we have some uh, program which would take those words, take this color, take this in, take this car, take those words, rearrange them a little bit, modify, add new syntax, do something with those words. We could easily achieve code on the right, right? And this is the main idea why, and this is the main, uh, how to call it, mm. case for macros. You, you've got a program which takes something, modifies the input, and produces the new code, right? The new output. It's not my idea, of course, not my idea. Somebody has this idea before, and this is how uh, implement, invoking the macro looks like in play framework. We'll not be looking more on this example, so let's focus on some new examples using new macros. So are you convinced for the case for macros? We just have removed a lot of code with one line. The nice piece of syntax for a big amount 
enormous amount of boilerplate code. So let's look at this example. And don't, look, don't try to understand this method. It's random method with random signature. It's not important right now. What is important? We want to retry this method in case of failure. So let's say that if this method fails, you want to repeat it certain amount of times. And if, if it finally will succeed, you want to return this value. If not, after certain, if it's still failing after certain amount of time, you want to, I don't know, throw an exception, let's say. So first, let's write this code. And this is how I try to write this code. It's super simple code. It's a for loop. At 20 times, we are repeating somebody. And we are evaluating this method. If this method is success, we return the result. If it's after 20 times, it's still throwing except it's still failing, we throw an exception. This is simple code like that. So what is wrong with this code? Actually, what is important, it's here, right? Evaluating of your method. This commented part, the, the body of our function, it's the only thing you need to understand behavior, to understand behavior of, the, of your method, right? Everything else, like this for loop, this if condition, this throwing exception, it's not important for you to understand method of the body, right? And moreover, you have to modify method body, right? You have to write code. You might make mistake during this writing code or something like that. And if you, okay, so th these are the disadvantages of this code. So this is ideal solution. You want to, you don't want to touch this method. Outside of this method, you want to write some annotation, pass some parameter, like number of repetitions, right? Let's call this annotation retry on failure. Name is whatever you want. So this annotation at compile time, and this is one of the main feature. If I will forget to repeat on, at compile time, you have to know that whatever we are doing today will be done at compile time. So at compile time, this annotation we ta will take body of our function and generate rest of the boilerplate code. So generate this for loop and the rest of the not important code, right? And we don't have to touch this method. So let's look at the implementation. So as I said, I will present this uh, new macros using the new API. So don't try to look too close to this code. It's very simple, but you might be feel overwhelmed. It's a lot of words here. But first of all, you have to import Scala Meta. Easy, so far so good. Then you've got uh, definition of your annotation with method apply, right? And for you, probably this inline keyword should be new. And the goal of the inline, key, inline modifier is to signify that application of this method are replaced with the method body. So this inline is saying, hey, whatever you annotated will be inlining other code into this method, right? So this is inline key keyword. So this is the second thing you have to write, you have to specify to write your macro. The third thing is this meta keyword. And this meta keyword is to set boundaries where your code is enriched with meta programming capabilities, right? And what are those meta programming capabilities? Uh, look at the signature method apply takes any, right? So if takes any, we have to probably some pattern match of this, uh, of this code. So this definition is our code, our annotated code. And we want to match it to some case, right? If we didn't match it to anything, we abort compilation and we are saying, hey man, you are annotating something wrong. That's a good question. Do you need a compiler for this or do you use this one? Yes, macro paradise, right? Mm. Yeah, but I thought it's a detail. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, this. Sure. yeah, yeah. You, mm -hmm. So let's focus on this case statement because it's weird. Obviously, it's something new here. So first of all, let's look this Q interpolator. We know S interpolator for interpolating string, right? The Q interpolator is very similar. It, it, its main purpose is to deconstruct and construct code. And to be more specific, to, to deconstruct and construct AST, right? Because when we build code, how would you build code? From strings, maybe? But then fun is over, right? If you have to modify strings, it's it's not fun anymore. So you've got one liner for extracting some, some Scala construction. If our case, we will be uh, extracting method, right? And method can have modifiers, right? Method can be private. Method can, not can, method has name, right? Method have type parameters and 
in arguments. So uh, what is important in this line is you've got, you can check it in documentation if you, will, if you feel kind of overwhelmed right now. What is important from the definition, you can extract every, anything what is important in one line, right? So, okay, so we have extracted anything what's important from the method definition. But you might say, okay, what's that two dots, three dots thing, right? It's kind of weird also. So two dots means that in this place you are expecting list of something. In our case, we are li expecting list of type parameters, right? In uh, three dots means that you are expecting list of list of something, in our case parameters, because you know, method can take many sets of arguments, right? So this is kind of uh, documentation in a nutshell. So we deconstructed code, right? We've got anything we want from the method. Now we want to inline replace old code with the new one, at compile time, at compile time, at compile time. I want to emphasize that. So look at this code. This, in previous slide, we have been deconstructing code. Here we are constructing code, also using this Q interpolator. And we are building method with the same signature, but we are changing the body. And you see it's human readable code. We just write for loop, we, we wrap body of our method with try, and if success, we return it else, throw exception, and so on. So why I emphasize that it is human readable code? Because I have said that we are uh, building AST, right? And AST is some API. You've got some API to build AST. So we've got normal types, normal Scala objects to build those uh, AST types, right? So in le on left, you've got quasi quotes, and on right, you've got corresponding AST uh, types. So you can build your tree using like row objects, low, row AST objects. But for, for simple example, like building literal, it's very easy, right? You're, you're just passing literal. But for also very simple case, like building code X plus Y, building AST X plus Y, it, at, at, under the hood, it transforms to kind of complicated tree, right? Not, right? It looks kind of complicated. I don't know what's that nail. I don't know what's that apply in fix. So this slide is just to show you that writing human readable quasi quotes is a huge asset. Okay, so next example of uh, macros. When I was preparing for conference, I, I checked the uh, Stack Overflow at Stack Scala Macros where you can find questions without surprises about Scala macros, and somebody has a question like that. So I want a class, I've got a class user, and I want to invoke method to map, right? I want to invoke, it is not my question. And uh, he wants to invoke method to map on this instance of this class, and the result should be map, where keys are the name of the parameter, and value, and, uh, and value is an um, evaluated value of this parameter, right? So he also said, I'm interested in automatically creating a method at compile time, right? So that's perfect. We can use macros for that. So this is our goal. We want to have class user with annotation mapable. I called it mapable, maybe it's stupid name, I don't know. So we've got this annotation. And at compile time, before, actually, before compilation, we want to add a method to map to it to result with map where we've got keys as parameter names and values as values as evaluated values of those parameters, right? So look at the implementation, and it's the same implementation and its previous example, couple of things changes. So don't be afraid of this code. Importing Scala meta, done. We are inlining, done. Meta, okay. And the same, we are pattern matching the, the, the input code. But in previous example, we have been pattern matching definition, right? But if you go to documentation and check, okay, I wanna parse a case class or class, you will find this pattern. You will copy it and pattern match over it. So we are doing exactly the same. We are, we are extracting everything we want from a class. And finally, we extracted the body of this class. So we extracted the body. Yes, this is the same slide, but in bigger font. Uh, and this is the implementation. And I should, you know, not show this implementation because we extracted everything we want. We've got it in a kind of type safe manner. We've got the AST objects right now. And this expression, don't try to understand it. It's like do logic, do logic. And this do logic means 
build me keys and values, right? In the next step, from we did the logic, right? We did the logic, and here we are building a map from those from those logics. So we are building expecting map. Next thing, we are updating body of our class. So body is a list of statements. We are adding new map, new method to map with uh, our new builded map, right? And finally, we are updating case class and we are returning new case class with updated body. So far so good? We just took a class in previous example, took a method, extract everything we want, did some logic in, with those uh, extracted values and returned new modified in previous example method, in this example class, right? And, and everything happened at compile time. So let's go back to our, uh, our, our timeline. And we just saw examples of new experimental feature called macros, this one, right? But actually something else is a main dish and it's called Scala Meta. So is Scala Meta the same as macros? It's also used for removing boilerplate code. And the answer is no. These are different metaprogramming toolkits which will help you dealing with different problems. So let's go back to um, Scala Meta. So as I said before, Scala Meta is a clean room implementation of metaprogramming toolkit in Scala. Cool. How you can use it? It's not Scala, it's, it, you can use it in different way than Scala macros. So uh, let's look at the use case first. In previous example, we have been reducing boilerplate code and generating code, right? And we have been working more in context of annotated definition, right? So if we have annotated method, we have been working in the context of this method. If we, if we have been annotating class, we are working in the context of the class. In Scala Meta, we will be working more on the whole project level. So for example, let's say this example. You want to, you are sitting to the new project and you want to build like code metrics tool, right? You've got some classes in your uh, project like smartphone, phone, iPhone, and so on. And you want to see dependencies between them. Which class inherits which class, right? You want to see how, how big those classes are, right? This is bigger class than this. You want to build like kind of this uh, code metrics tool. So this is good use case for Scala Meta, for analyzing whole code in your project. So it's more on the, it, it operates more on the project level than on the annotation level like in the previous example with macros. So different uh, use cases. Who knows what's Ruby on Rails? It's like MVC framework, everybody knows what's that. And Ruby on Rails has a kind of cool feature called convention over configuration, right? So it means if you've got roots and you specify accordingly to these roots, controller, model, and so on, everything works out of the box without any configuration, right? It's a kind of cool feature, but what is the biggest disadvantage of Rails? Ruby, for me. <laughs> It's a dynamic language and it's an interpreted language. So you want to have this kind of conventions checker at compile time. You don't want your client to call you and say something like, hey, apparently you are not following Ruby on Rails conventions because we've got runtime error, right? So uh, the main idea, uh, the kind of use, uh, kind of use case for Scala Meta here would be to implement this kind of conventions in some Scala framework. Okay, so let's start with some, describing some API. Scala Meta is a framework for tokenizing and parsing code. And I imagine this uh, library as some kind of a tool which you can inject into different stages of compilation, right? And on different stage of compilation, you've got slightly different API and you've got slightly different use cases, we, we, what, what you want to achieve in, in this. Uh, Same question as before, do you need it in order to do it? Uh, for Scala Meta, no. It's only for, in Scala Meta, you have to just import. And that's it. It does it, and import, that's super simple to start. With macros, you still have to, you know. 
Okay, so on this slide, you've got different five uh, compilation stages. So how you can inject Scala Meta on one of those compilation stages and what you can do, what you can do, what's the use case? So let's start with some lexical analysis. And lexical analysis, lexi what lexical analyzer do? It, it grabs a code and tokenizes it, split it into tokens without understanding the code. So let's, let's look at the, some example. We've got code, some code. What lexical analyzer will do in this case, it will split it for different tokens. This value modifier, it will be different token. Space, it will be different token. Y and X, are, these are var variable names. They are also tokens, right? Also, a sign sign, an equality sign, these are different tokens. So lexical analyzer has to, you know, figure it out that double assign, it's not double assign, it's like equal, right? So this is the job for uh, lexical analyzer. And during the lexical analysis, you've got uh, spaces, you've got commas, you've got everything which, uh, what you have in your code. So why you want to tokenize code? Or maybe how you want, to, uh, how you can tokenize code in Scala Meta? Very simple. You are importing Scala Meta. First thing, like in the macros examples, you are importing Scala Meta. After that, you've got some crazy implicits flying around your code. And one of the implicits gives you ability to tokenize strings. And after tokenization of the string, you've got method, you've got uh, resulted, um, resulted uh, object after tokenization of the string is a token which, which has two states, success and error, right? Okay. And so what you can, so okay, we tokenized code, cool. What we can do with this? We can print line tokens. So as I said, value is a token, space is a token, variable names, these are token. Assign equality is a, is a different tokens, right? You can print line structure more for debugging. You will have exact place in your code where this token appears, right? So, and you can also print line new syntax for, for uh, print line syntax, right? So make those tokens in human readable form like, like previously, right? Okay, cool. How you can use it? What are possible use cases? So let's say that you want to write some super simple formatter, which will replace some pattern, right? And you want to replace get or else null to or null, like super simple uh, formatter. You want to replace filter head option to find. These are equivalent, right? But you want to have this kind of more sophisticated code, let's call it. We'll not be looking at the implementations right now because we don't have much time to do this, but uh, I have these examples in my blog post, and it's possible to achieve this, uh, achieve this kind of formatter very easily using those three methods I showed you in the previous slide. And also, if you want to preview something more complex, there's like a formatter called Scala FMT. On the main page of Scala Meta, you will find also a link to this uh, library. And it, author of this library heavily operates on the, on the token level. And what is he doing? He is formatting the code. So code on the left is before formatting, code on the right is after formatting, right? So this is the use case where you can use Scala Meta at, at compilation stage of lexical analysis, right? So formatting code, looking for some patterns, and so on. So let's move to the next compilation stage. And next compilation stage is parsing code. And parser uh, needs simpler data structure than, uh, than, after, than we've got after tokenization. In parser, we don't care about spaces, we don't care about semicolons, and so on. We need a super simple construction, like AST tree, which, which knows, which will give us information about semantics of the code. On this stage, parser will try to understand code. In previous stage, what we did is, what, is just tokenize code, split it into different words. Here parser will need to uh, understand more this code. So how to parse code in Scala Meta? Very simple, we are importing Scala Meta again, and we've got method parse. And look, we have to parameterize this method with specified type. Our parser needs to know what we are parsing. In this example, we are parsing type, right? But if, if you want to parse something else, you have to, parse, you have to specify it with different type. And, and the same, after parse, we've got object parsed, which, ha which can be success and error, but actually it's not important right now. 
So let's look at the different ways how you can parse something. And uh, if you want to parse statement, you need to parse with the type statement, right? If you want to parse case, uh, case uh, pattern, you have to parse it with the case type and so on, right? It's like more, uh, it's not so, uh, it's, it's more type safe on this level, right? So what will happen if you will parse case statement as statement, it's normal statement. You will have compile time error that compiler will tell you, hey man, you are parsing something else and you are saying that we're gonna parse st statement, right? So here, parser will prevent us from doing something very stupid. We can still do something stupid, but not very stupid. Okay, so if Scala macros are built on top of Scala meta, can we use in Scala meta quasi quotes? Yes, we can. And after parsing code, we can extract values in the same way we have been extracting when we have been building new uh, method or new case class during the macros examples, right? So we can extract it very easily. One line and we've got everything we want in the AST types. Okay, somebody is counting the time? Where are organizers? Good, we've got a lot of time. So joke, no, just kidding. Okay, let's say that we want to uh, implement some kind of a pattern, some kind of convention. It might be stupid convention, but still. So let's say that every string constant, you want to keep at the object constant, right? Very simple situation. You just want, if you've got a string in your project, it has to be in the object constant. You just have this kind of pattern. You've got this idea. And moreover, you want every, each um, string to be assigned only once to a value. Don't know why, that's your idea. And our object clearly doesn't follow this rule because Ruby is assigned to two different value names, right? So how we can prevent this at compile time? How we can check this at compile time? So let's say this is invoke, so we will be writing method validate and we will be parsing our object constant, right? We will be parsing it at source. So it's one of the types you will find in the documentation. We will not be parsing it because in the Constance file, you might find different Scala constructions, right? Depends. In the main class, I don't know, in this example. Well, but you want to do it at the time, do you think you can build an SBT? You can build an SBT uh, plugin to, uh, do, to do this, but uh, okay. when I was writing these examples, I, I simply invoked the method sure. validate. It's like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. if, for me, it was also kind of uh, different at the beginning because macros, they are in the different projects right now, right? And, and Scala Meta, you, it's not in the different projects. You're just writing methods which under the hood will operate on this compiler. It's kind of different. This is why I want to emphasize macros and Scala Meta is a different thing, different problem. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, signature of our validate method and we are doing the same as we have been doing in the three previous examples, or two, I don't know. So we are extracting something from the code. And in our source, which we, which we have as an input, we've got two dots stats. What does it mean? We've got list of statements. Because in the source file, we can have many class definition, object, whatever, right? So we are interested only in the object, right? Copy this from the documentation. We're only interested only in the object in the file, which name is constant. And we've, if we've got this object and everything what is important uh, from this object, we can start implementing some logic. And don't try to understand it. What, what we do here is just taking all the values, group by the value, value, right? Uh, group by the assigned string, and if this list after grouping is bigger than one, it means that this string is assigned more than once to different value, to different uh, values, right? So it's very, I would say that it might be overwhelming for you because it's a lot of, you know, maybe new stuff for you, but it's very, if you will download some examples and try to play with them, 
it will be very straightforward because any idea you want to implement will be super simple. Import Scala Meta, extract whatever you want from whatever construction you want, and do the logic using the Scala Meta API. So, okay, code metrics. So code metrics, I'm not sure if I want to show you this example. Oh, we will be building code metrics, right? So we want to build something which will take all these different case classes and uh, case classes, traits, objects, whatever. It will take some Scala constructions and it will give you informations about them. So let's skip this, let's skip this. We are doing the same as uh, in previous example, right? Source, whatever is in the file, try to, ex try to find what I'm interested in. And this is actually most, uh, the, the body, the real implementation. So if, if, if you found an object in the file, increment object number. If you've got class, increment class number, and so on and so on, right? So in one line you have to very easily um, specify what you are looking for, extract whatever is important inside, and do the logic. In our example, we'll be simply counting number of objects. On my blog post, I build it kind of more detailed example, so I encourage you to play with this. So you might go further with this metrics idea and you know implement your own. And this is kind of use case we, I had an, just a couple days ago. So I have an object, my application boot, and this my application boot has method run, which take three implicit parameters. Whatever these implicit are, don't try it. It's some kind of actor system from ASCA library. It's not important here. And what I want to do is force people to not create those implicit here. Because I always want to run this method outside of this object. So I want to run this method from the different boot object which, are, which will run the application, right? So what, what are our possible, how we can do it? You can write comments, don't create actor system here, and start to threaten people. But always you will find somebody bigger than you. And in my example, it's not hard to find somebody bigger than me. So it's, it will not work. So using the API I just showed you, you can very easily extract this object, extract anything that was important, and find the places where somebody is creating new actor system in this object. And then you can throw compilation error, right? Or warning, whatever you want. So, okay, so I hope that I show you some kind of, mm, how to call it, use cases for Scala Meta. It's different thing than, um, it's different thing than Scala Macros. It gives you possibilities for building different tools. And I believe that after familiarizing with the API, with previewing with the API, these are the links for the API, uh, you will, find the new ways how you, can, um, how you can use this library to achieve your goal. So I hope that I convinced you to spend Friday night writing meta program. And if you want to spend Friday night at island surrounded by beautiful beaches and environment writing meta program, talk to me because our office in Bangkok is super close to the best islands in the world. So thank you for listening and I hope you enjoy. It's like yeah. Uh, the plus the plus equals in there that you know. Yes. Because it's like a lot of weird and kind of things. So um, is there any way that we can debug and test and verify that we're still able to test? Uh, so you want to debug output from the map, for example? Did I understood uh, correctly? Output. Depending what you ask, if, for example, you generated code, right, and it's what you you generated code and you push it further to the compilation, 
So if you made compile time error, you will have compile time error. If you will have like logic error in your business logic, then you have to. How I wrote, I'm not sure if I understood your question, but how I wrote this kind of examples. I've got also bigger examples when I, you know, when I was writing really huge macro. And how I did it was write the code at the first time, the big one, right? And then step by step replacing each, you know, the, yeah, yeah. And if you've got, you've got build macro, it's building a lot of boilerplate code, right? And you've got, at some point you've got a bug. How I did I took the generated code, I replace I replace the code where I invoke macro with the generated code, and I debug it like normal code, right? Because you're it, it gives you free to learn and yeah. free to So yeah, so so you copied the macro output to your code, you are debugging it normally, and you found the bug, you repaired it, you change your macro to generate better uh, repaired code, right? So Yes, yes, like for example, you, let's say that you want to, uh, yeah, let's say that you, you just loaded the file, the source, right? And by some example, you forgot to write two dots, right? You will have compile time error at this stage because this um, uh, interpolator will ex expect to have list of statements in your file. And you just write that you, you are not expecting this. So you'll have a lot of compilation errors if you will do something not logical, right? You need macro paradise to write macro. If you use Scala Meta, you don't need macro paradise. In which? In macros? Actually, I'm not sure you can do similar things. That's the first thing. And the second thing, like, for me, macros, you are operating on the annotation context, right? You annotated case class. You are operating on the case class you just annotated, right? You annotated method. You operate on the method you just annotated. In Scala Meta, you've got library like any other library you might imagine, which you just use to, to, to inspect your code, to analyze your code, right? I think the def macros. Yeah, but all the specialization you can be showing. I mean, in, in, in Macro Paradise, you just get access to the OST. You don't get access yes. to anything you show. So yes. here, you really have a more controlled experience. Yeah, that's the first thing. And I think you also asked about what is removed from Macro Paradise, right? In that case, I placed it in the main method, right? In uh, main, it was super simple, object, super simple code, right? So I, I invoked the method. So you can invoke meta in the code yes, itself. you are not doing anything else. So uh, in in macros, you've got project which your project depends on the macro project, right? Yes. So before your project runs, your macro will generate yes. anything, will inline everything. And you have to separate it from the 
Yes, exactly. Uh, here you are bu built SBT at Scala method. Cool. Write a method in whatever you want. Invoke this method. That's all, right? So, mm, and you ask about comp SBT plugin. So maybe you can add an SBT plugin, which will do it. You can you can you can invoke it last, like. Ah, so you want to mix macros I mean, yeah, with yes. Scala meta? Yeah, if you have the two two implementation in the same uh, uh, Scala, um, this macro will run first. Mm, I'm not sure you about it. Or even if you don't think about implementation, but about meta, mm -hmm. uh, you, you might be able to call a con multiple transformation on the same. Maybe yes. So you're asking, you're saying something like that. Uh, you annotated case class with annotation. Yeah. Then your meta program from Scala meta is doing something on that file. For example, Ah, I think it will be invoked, if you are thinking about Scala meta, it will be invoked like a normal code. Yeah, sequentially. sequentially. So you will invoke method validate and you will validate it. And under the validate, you will do some, I don't know, do something else. It, it, for me, it was weird when I was writing macros in the previous API, and then I started to look at Scala meta and I couldn't find the use cases for it. So because Yes, yes. But at compilation time, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so uh, you will, you will, it, you might affect performance like any other method, yeah, right? So, so this is the. Some other questions? Uh, what line number? class file in your target will have uh, that modified code, right? So if you will have error yes, with... But, yes, but in the case of the modified code, the, the reference to the source code will still be the same. Ah, the same maybe. So, so the error but, will be on that file. Okay, so you will have error on annotation, yes. but, the ne the, but the message of the error will be like... What yeah, is Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for attending.